on Animal Miracles. An abused dog left on the highway to die gets a second chance. Now, Angel brings light to the hopeless lives of street kids. That's why they named her Angel, because it was like an angel coming from heaven to save me. Then, a burglar terrorizes a quiet neighborhood, avoiding houses with dogs. But he never thinks to worry about a cat. My husband and I were sound asleep, and all of a sudden we heard a blood-curdling scream and a thud. It scared me awake. But first, in one of our most amazing stories ever, a family dog senses danger and tries to warn his owners. What happens next will blow you away. Tornadoes ravage vast areas of the United States each year. They cause billions of dollars in damage and cost countless lives. New advances in radar imaging and all of the resources of the National Weather Service help to give people in vulnerable regions as much notice as possible. But for the family in our next story, only a miracle could save them from the killing winds of nature's greatest fury. This just in the National Weather Service has issued a tornado warning for Keith and Lincoln counties. Late spring is tornado season on the plains of central Nebraska, where Brad Stickelman owns a 300-acre cattle ranch. His closest neighbor is two miles away. So if Brad isn't with his wife, Janine, he's with his dog, Champ. Champ and Brad are true companions. If I ever have to find Brad, I always look for Champ or vice versa. On one muggy spring morning in May of last year, Champ was acting peculiar. Champ would just, he would just, just absolutely wouldn't leave the house. He'd get in front of you and sit and look at you. Then off he went to the basement. Brad knew what Champ was trying to tell him. What's the matter, boy? He's just a good weather barometer. Champ just has an act for predicting storms. He always knows when bad weather's around. He's better than a weatherman. Brad headed out to get his work done quickly, but there was no sign of a storm anywhere. Later in the day, Brad returned to the house and to his astonishment, Champ was still in the basement. Let's go. Come on, Champ. He tried to get him to come up, but Champ wouldn't budge. By the time Janine arrived home from her job at a bank in town, it was late afternoon, and Brad was concerned. He's been down here since the morning. Oh, hey, Champ, what is it? Of course, from previous experiences, we knew that we were going to have something of a bad storm. We didn't know what, but normally Champ would at least go outside. We knew something was going to happen. Trusting Champ's instinct, they canceled their usual outdoor activities and decided to stay close to home. But Champ's behavior was different this time. They figured whatever was coming, it must be big. Champ was right. A storm front was approaching from the south, and now two twisters had touched down in distant parts of the state. But at the Stickelman Ranch, the weather was still calm. We were just being watchful of the sky, and we were looking for any bad weather. I was really checking to the southwest. I was watching it every, every few minutes. And the more nervous he got, the more nervous we got. Finally, the storm front hit the ranch, and it hit hard. Nearby storm chasers shot this footage. I was in the basement exercising because I needed to do something. I heard the hail hit, so I ran upstairs to see what was going on. A tornado touched down a few miles south of the ranch, but the couple were too far from town to hear the warning sirens. It rapidly developed into an F3 twister, packing winds up to 200 miles per hour. The hell was coming down, and it was three, four, five inches around, and I wanted to save a couple and put them in the deep freeze. 
Brad stepped outside, but because of Champ's unusual behavior, he scanned the horizon. Now he saw the massive tornado tearing across the ranch. It was headed straight for the house. Just a great big dark swirling cloud and a big roar. Just uh, these sucking trees out of the ground and, and fence posts and wire. I just remember looking up and seeing this big, huge black mass. It had picked up all the dirt from the fields that it had crossed and it was just coming right at us. It was just an awful feeling. You knew it was going to hit you. They headed for the basement bathroom. first trying to get Champ to come in with us, and he all of a sudden disappeared. But the tornado's wind sucked the bathroom door closed. What would happen to Champ as the twister ripped into the house? Find out when we return after this. When the Stickleman's dog, Champ, ran to the basement, Brad and Janine knew that a storm must be coming. But how bad would it be? They soon found out. This is storm chaser footage of the F3 tornado that was bearing down on the ranch. They fled into the basement bathroom, but when they tried to pull Champ in, he ran in terror as the twister sucked the door shut. Then the full force of the twister tore into the house. It's a terrible, terrible roar. We heard glass shattering, boards breaking, doors flying, everything being sucked and blown and broken to bits around you. It just didn't seem like we could survive anything of that force. Something kept tapping me on the shoulder like that, and I finally got to where I could see and it was sucking the wall in and out, hitting me on the shoulder with it. And when that started, that wall started hitting me on the shoulder, I figured it was going. And then if that wall went, I knew we had to go. I didn't know where Champ was, so we had to just hope that Champ would survive. After several minutes of absolute terror, the tornado moved on from the Stickleman's house, tearing through the fields and farms to the north. Then the tornado suddenly coiled back up into the clouds, leaving behind a 12-mile-long scar gouged out of the Nebraska countryside. The roaring quit, and at that point, you knew that the tornado had probably passed over you. Brad and Janine struggled to get out of their demolished house. Their first concern was Champ. He was nowhere when we came out. Probably the tornado had got him, and he was gone. That's what we figured. Champ. The first thing I did when I got outside was look for Champ. Champ! It was pretty tough. You know, you work all your life for something and a couple minutes is gone. It was pretty fast. It was just like a bomb had been thrown right on your house and everything was just splintered and broken. Everything was just blown to bits or else gone. The roof was gone, and, and uh, there were boards protruding everywhere. Down, we didn't know where to walk because of all the power lines being down. It was just awful. Much of the countryside lay in ruin. The unusually powerful twister had lifted cars and tractors and then crushed them. It had pulled down countless power lines and ripped up several farmhouses, and Champ was nowhere to be found. It seemed impossible for him to have survived this kind of devastation. And then, miles away, a storm chaser was videotaping the massive destruction the tornado had left in its wake. This is his footage of what could only be described as a miracle. It was Champ. He staggered from the ruins of other houses towards the friendly cameraman. 
You okay, baby? Oh, did you, did you just survive the big F3, didn't you? Wow. You okay, baby? That evening, Brad and Janine were devastated. They were certain Champ had been killed. But in town, the storm chasers found someone who recognized the dog and brought him home. Champ! Champ! Oh, oh Champ, darling. how you doing, buddy? Oh, thank you so much. It was just pretty special to finally see Champ and to know that he was okay. He was pretty bedraggled looking. He was limping. I guess he was picked up by the tornado because Champ would never be that far from home. I really don't know how Champ survived. Uh, you know, he's had to have been picked up and carried with what we figure is three or four miles north of our place, and uh, how he ever made it, I don't know. I'm glad he did, but I don't know how he did. Over the next year, the Sticklemans rebuilt their ranch. They thought they had lost everything, but they had everything that matters. They were all alive, a miracle they attribute to their four-legged forecaster. Champ saved us because we wouldn't have been out watching the storm nearly as close. I truly believe that animals are probably a lot smarter than we give them credit for. And I really think if you pay more attention to your animals, you might learn something. Well, Champ was kind of our savior because we knew enough to stay close to home, to stay close enough uh, where we could get to safety. I mean, Champ was smart, probably smarter than us. Coming up next, the tough streets of Brooklyn are home to a teenager without hope. My father was real close to me. When he died, I started drinking. I was doing all kinds of drugs. I didn't care about nobody no more. Only a dog with a history as desperate as his can reach him. When someone is abusive to animals or people, it's often because they themselves were abused. It seems like a hopeless cycle, destined to repeat. But there are some rare people who break that cycle, changing many lives in the process. Our next story is about an abused dog who transforms her horrific past into a miracle of hope. There is no tougher place to grow up than on the streets of New York City. Edwin Ruiz grew up in Brooklyn with a troubled family. In turn, Edwin fought with everybody. The only person he felt he could count on was his father. My father died when, he, when I was 16. My father was real close to me. When he died, everything got worse. I started drinking. I was doing all kinds of drugs. I felt lonely. I felt unloved. I didn't care about nobody no more. Edwin is just one of countless troubled teens in this city, but sometimes, even in the darkest corners, there is a glimmer of light. Do you know where this church is? Augie Meyer is a street evangelist who decided to make it his life's work to try to reach out to these kids. When he started extolling the virtues of going to church to the street's most jaded and violent youths, he soon discovered it's a message that usually falls on deaf ears. Eight o'clock, it is rocking, it is shocking. It's called aftershock. They got bebops, cats like you, females hanging out. About With such a daunting task before him, the last thing Augie thought he wanted was a dog. Until one day in 1998. I was watching the news. And I started to hear this horror story about this dog. And I didn't want to listen to this because I was eating. It was making me sick, literally. And I flipped to the next channel, but the next channel had a shot of her. And um, now I, I watched. It was a story of shocking cruelty. She had her mouth bound shut with wire. She had her legs bound together. And she was left on the side of the Long Island Expressway, I guess, to die. In addition to the obvious abuse, the dog also had a broken pelvis. A good Samaritan brought the terrified dog to the North Shore Animal League. The shelter treated the abused dog's wounds, but the frightened animal mostly needed a loving home. Their director of publicity, Marge Stein, was asked to contact the media. I said, what, what is the dog's name? So they said, Jelly Bean. And I said, what? What kind of a name is Jelly Bean for an animal that has had, that has gone through such terrible, terrible trauma? I said, I am changing the dog's name. 
I am calling her Angel because despite all of the atrocity, she had the most angelic personality. When Augie saw Angel's story on TV, something magical happened. Augie had an inspiration. He and the dog were meant to be together. I knew God was going to give me the dog. He had something special in mind. Augie adopted Angel and took her home. With his love and care, Angel soon had enough confidence to venture out on a daily basis. He would take her with him when he talked to people on the street. How you doing, Mom? We would walk and walk and walk, so basically the whole neighborhood here in Glendale knows my dog. She just has a beautiful spirit. It's just something about her that's just magnetic. It's just, we, you just fall in love with her. She's absolutely beautiful. It was on these neighborhood walks that Augie began to realize that Angel had a higher purpose. When I started to take her out in the street, people would comment, people would talk, and the next thing I knew, I started to talk to them about what God did in this dog's life, how he rescued her from, from a, a life like that in the sense of how she was abandoned and victimized and abused. And then I found myself saying to people, if God cared that much about this dog, how much more does he care about you? Later that year, Augie and Angel were in a park when they saw a group of kids. It was Good Friday. There was one young man there, tat on his neck, tats on his body, very, very rough looking. And I said, only by God do I do this. Only by God do I do this. But Augie told Angel's story and a miracle happened. Edwin listened. He started speaking to me about what she went through. I couldn't believe it. I felt sorry for the dog. It felt like me in a way. I felt like I was, like I was the dog too that I felt like I was tied up, and then I was, like somebody beat me down too, like they were beating me down and just threw me out. Through Angel, Augie was able to make a connection with Edwin. All I remember saying, this is not touched by an angel, but God does love you. And I invited him to go that night, and he showed up that night. That first meeting at church was the beginning of a fundamental change in Edwin's life. I started learning about the gospel and learning about the Bible and learning about spirituality, that started opening my eyes. Today, Augie fills a void in Edwin's life. Augie comes to me like a father, a father that I lost a long time ago. Now Edwin expresses himself with art instead of anger, and he's left his former life behind. I want to draw. I want to I wanna do something with my art. I want a chance to do something with my art and do something for God. He was running with gangs over here, and I took him out of that whole environment, and I would have never gotten to do that if I didn't have the dog. I think that's why they named her Angel, because this was like an angel coming from heaven to save me. Because I know for, for a fact, if I still would have stood the same way, right now I would have been in a coffin, six feet under. Augie and Angel are still working the streets of New York today, reaching more troubled kids with Angel's amazing story and the promise of a second chance. So what's up with all this God stuff? Oh, like I told you, man, every good and perfect gift comes from above. Yo, man, God got a plan for your life, man. In Jeremiah 29, 11, he says, I know the plans are happy for you, not to harm you, but to prosper you and give you hope for a future. We love that dog. She's, <laughs> yeah. she's great. This sweet dog, you know. Just to think, you know, that a dog can go through so much brutal things and still have joy, you know, like it's just a peaceful dog. And, you know, you gotta just thank God for Angel. Angel is a miracle because she survived this abuse and, and her capacity to love is unbelievable. And now she's in my life and I take her with me wherever I go to be able to speak and, and reach out to these young people. That's a miracle. And see, I'm just blessed to have her in my life. After the break, a young couple in Pennsylvania is sound asleep when a burglar breaks into their house. My first thought was, oh my gosh. And I immediately thought somebody's in the house. But what their cat Aggie does about it will astound you.
Have you ever met someone whose character exceeded your expectations? That's always a nice feeling. When a loving couple in Pennsylvania takes in a disabled kitten, they expect a burden. Instead, they get an able and devoted companion. But the real surprise comes when that cat saves them from a terrible crime. It's proof once again that every life is a miracle. When Lynn and John Seeley first took in a kitten that no one wanted, they thought it would only be temporary. They tried to find it another home, but they fell in love and soon they couldn't imagine why anybody wouldn't want the gentle calico. She's a very friendly, sassy little kitty and uh, she gets along with everybody. Aggie is 12 years old now, and in those 12 years, she's never scratched anybody ever. Not the vet, not myself, my husband, nobody. Lynn is a writer and named the cat after Agatha Christie. Perhaps Aggie takes after Lynn's penchant for language and drama. Aggie understands a, a great many words and terms, I would say close to 40. One of her favorites, of course, is dinner. If you even spell it, she knows what that means, and she'll come tearing into the kitchen. Aggie has often provided inspiration for Lynn's stories, but sometimes real life can be more astounding than fiction. One night in 1992, Aggie did something so amazing Lynn couldn't have made it up. It was very cold outside, it was January. We had the uh, windows shut tightly and uh, my husband and I made our way up to go to sleep as usual that night. John and Lynn were soon sleeping soundly, unaware of the recent rash of burglaries in the neighborhood. Sometime later that night, Aggie woke up. She heard a noise and she knew she had to investigate. Aggie took cover in her cat tree, hoping the stranger would go away, but the situation only became more perilous. Aggie knew her family was in danger. As the burglar approached closer and closer, she summoned all of her courage, and she attacked. All of a sudden, we heard a blood-curdling scream. Yeah, what was that? That scream was really loud and it was intense and it sounded like somebody was in pain. I was quite startled and my heart was pounding. Lynn and John crept downstairs to investigate. That's when we saw that the window was wide open and it certainly shocked me. When I got closer to the window to look at it, I saw the, the man's shoe kind of balanced on the windowsill. Sweetie, somebody could still be in the house. What's going on? I'm going to call the police. Okay. Check and see if okay. John called 911. It was then that they saw Aggie. I was a little puzzled as to why she would be in the cat tree, because when we went to sleep, she was upstairs on the bed. Then Lynn noticed something alarming. I noticed that there was something smudged on her paws and it was red. And I, I looked over and looked closer and it looked like blood to me. When I saw blood on Aggie's paws, this really changed things considerably. I thought maybe Aggie was hurt, but Aggie was not acting hurt. She was wagging her tail back and forth and she was chortling. And that's a special little meow when she's especially proud of herself or happy. I call her Aggie Waggy when she's really happy, and she was Aggie Waggy. <laughs> I guess she was just waiting for us to figure it out. Then John noticed blood on the windowsill. John and Lynn could only come to one incredible conclusion. It was at that point that I realized it had to be somebody else's blood. And why would there be blood on the windowsill unless Aggie had attacked whoever had tried to enter the home? 
A police officer soon arrived and checked out the scene. There were footprints leading away from the house, and in his haste, the intruder had left his tools behind. The policeman agreed with us. He looked at the height of the cat tree, and he determined that Aggie had probably reached out with both of her claws and, um, and struck him in the face. The officer said uh, he had never met a cat hero before, but tonight was his night. The officer told them about the other robberies in the area and was amused that the burglar had avoided houses with dogs. I think that Aggie sort of took up the watchdog attitude because she's very, very uh, interested in anything that's going on, anything that she hears. She's very sensitive to sounds. Aggie's sensitivity to sound and smell is truly remarkable because there is another miracle. The reason that nobody had wanted her, Aggie is completely blind. I think that she just lives large. She's always pushing the limits of her domain and uh, who she is as a cat. Perhaps Aggie's handicap even gave her an advantage. She could sense that this was an aggressive stranger and she didn't need to see him to know at all times exactly where he was. And in taking action, she might even have saved the Seelys' lives, just like they saved hers. I received a phone call about a month later, uh, and the officer said that they had arrested somebody for burglary, and the man had scratches all over his face. The miracle here is um, this blind kitty's ability to um, not be held back by the hand that life had dealt her. I really do shudder to think what would have happened to us had she not been in our household. I, I think it is a miracle. Coming up next, a successful businesswoman is trapped in an abusive relationship. Feeling desperate and alone, she finds salvation in an unlikely place, swimming with humpback whales. These fantastic creatures change her life forever. Humpback whales grow to almost 50 feet long and they weigh up to 40 tons, yet they are mammals just like us. And like humans, they also sing. All the male humpbacks in nearby pods sing the exact same song, although the song changes from year to year. We may never know what they mean, but the woman in our next story heard the songs firsthand, and to her, they were the sounds of a miracle. In early 1998, Leona Nichols lived and worked in Leesburg, Virginia. She was a vice president at a telecom company, but despite the appearance of success, Leona was at an all-time low. An abusive marriage had left her feeling worthless, with no purpose in life. I was so tired of fighting it that I started praying that I got sick so it would land me in the hospital and get me away from him. For years, she suppressed her problems by throwing herself into work, and she'd succeeded, but it was a hollow victory. I was still a workaholic. Kevin, can you get Weinberg around the phone for me? There was a lot of stress at my job. Um, I would work six, seven days a week, 14 hours a day, because I wanted to show that I was successful. Okay, I gotta tell you, I can't do this anymore. I've gotta go. And then no, I started thinking, no now you have a solution. You can kill yourself. At the end of her rope, Leona needed something, but she didn't know what. I gotta call you back. And then one day, browsing the internet, she saw it. I happened upon a website um, that advertised swimming with humpbacks, and I just thought, wow. I immediately ran into my boss and said, I'm taking off, I'm gonna go swimming with humpback whales. Soon, Leona found herself on a boat in the Dominican Republic that would take her on a week-long visit with humpback whales. And I was like, oh boy, I'm like a kid in the candy shop. Let's get started. I could feel the humpback whales. I could feel them out there. 90 miles offshore, 
the group boarded smaller boats and set off in search of the humpbacks. Then they were there. A massive shape appeared in the depths below. We were looking overboard, and you can see them underneath the water because the top of their peck fins are white. They leave a fingerprint, and it's just this round spot that's on the water, and I put my hand on it. I was like, oh, wow, this is where, this is where she was. Every winter, thousands of humpback whales migrate to Silver Bank, a coral reef north of the Dominican Republic, to breed and nurse their young. There, in the warm tropical waters, Leona found herself surrounded by whales. You're out in the middle of the Caribbean with a female who is, say, 40, 45 feet long, who has a 15-foot pick fin, and she's slapping it on the water, and you're, you know, maybe 15 feet away. You're just thinking, this can't be happening. This is just too good to be true. Teresa Wagner organizes these trips and swims with the whales every year. Time after time, she has witnessed the inexplicable power of these encounters, especially when the whales are approached on their own terms. We get in the water only when we're still in a very small boat and they come to us. And then we slip in. We do not swim toward them. We wait for them to come to us. Leona felt her whole life was focused on this moment. Soon a mother and calf appeared below and Leona slipped into the water. When you're in the water with them and you hear them singing, it's like hearing angels sing. I look straight down and about 20 feet below me probably is the mommy and the baby. And I literally just stopped breathing. It was so awesome that she just totally gave us complete trust. And it, that was just the most wonderful thing. Alone, there among the whales, the corporate VP was gone, and only a child filled with awe and wonder remained. I believe it touched a part of my heart or my soul, my spirit that I didn't even know was there. I think I remember saying, thank you, God, for this gift. Leona was gripped by a powerful sense of connection to this fellow creature. In the presence of the whale, she felt years of pain and sorrow wash away. The gentle giants below seemed to speak to her about how each of us has a place in this world. You're troubled, you're thinking there's just no way out of this big bottomless pit. And then all of a sudden, I understood that there was a reason for me to be here on this earth. At this moment, swimming with these great creatures, Leona found peace and suddenly knew what to do. I was a sinking ship, and um, they helped save me and, and turn me around. It was a transformation that Teresa has witnessed many times before. The presence of the magnificent creatures seemed to put everything in a new perspective. She was given great confirmation of what she knew deep down she needed to do with her life next, which was make some tremendously courageous changes, um, which she did. Coming back from the trip gave me, I believe, the courage to throw out my abusive husband, quit smoking, take control of my life. Today, Leona is happy again. She is also preparing to move to Hawaii, where she plans to open her own business, taking others to experience the wonders of the beautiful whales. God felt that my love for the humpback whales would be what would save me. And I listened to them, and 
I say that they saved my life. Next, the remarkable story of Bud Woodward and his herding dog, Tuffy. One day working the cattle, tragedy strikes when the herd stampedes, knocking Bud into the path of their thundering hooves. Tuffy was his only hope. I just kind of froze and I just absolutely figured that, that my dad was probably dead. Herding dogs have been used for thousands of years to keep herds of sheep or cattle together and to protect them from wild animals. Well, those spiked collars that some owners use today were actually invented to protect herding dogs when they fought off predators. In our next story, an injured cattleman's life depends on his herding dog's ancient protective instinct. Bud Woodward had always loved his work raising cattle in Lewis, Iowa. In 1999, he turned 80 years old with no plans to retire. I've been working cattle for 60 years. Get that guy right there. Get him. His son, Dwayne, owes a lot to the lessons of his father. He's kind of a man of few words, but the words he says are valuable, and you, you, you tend to listen. And uh, I, I respect him and love him dearly. One thing they have all learned is that there is danger involved in moving 1,300-pound animals through tight quarters. When you go to crowding a steer, you never know what they're going to do. And if one breaks, they're all going to break. That's exactly why Dwayne's wife, Karen, had recently started worrying about her father-in-law's safety. I felt like it was coming time that maybe he shouldn't be quite so active in farming especially with the cattle. Dwayne. Grandpa wasn't moving quite as fast. He wasn't picking his feet up quite so high. Done a little more shuffling. Maybe he shouldn't be working with the cattle anymore. He's not gonna like that. You try telling him. Uh. I don't know whether I had a premonition or not that something was going to happen. But later that same morning, something did happen. 40 steer were to be loaded for market. A truck was scheduled to arrive and the cattle had to be in the loading shed. As usual, their dog Tuffy helped round the cattle up. The way Tuffy helps me move cattle, that he barks at them, nips at their heel, and uh, just gets their attention and shows them, I'm boss and you're going where I want you to. Cattle herding dogs are specifically trained to stay out of the way of the oncoming animals so they don't get trampled. Dwayne, Bud, and Tuffy followed their usual routine that morning. We each had a whip in our hand, and Tuffy was with us, unleashed. And uh, we run the cattle into uh, a confinement pen and shut the gate behind it. Bud then put Tuffy on a leash. At that point, his job was done, so Dad had him back behind this temporary gate on a leash, and I was following the cattle up to the shed to close the gate on them to be ready to load. I had all the cattle in the confinement shed except one. And then as he got to the final end of the runway, he turned around and snorted, and I turned around and looked. And Dad and Tuffy were standing behind his gate, and I told Dad, look out, this steer is going to break. Dad, I think he's going to break. Move. And the steer jumped the gate, knocking the gate down on Dad and Tuffy. And I turned my back, and all the cattle were coming out of the shed, so I had to crawl the fence to save my height. The steer had started a stampede, and both Bud and Tuffy were trapped under the gate. The other 39 head of cattle were going to run right over them. When I seen them cattle, when they all come down, I could just see their balls, their eyes, they had their head down. They weighed 1,350 pounds, each one. I thought they was going to trample me right over top of me, and that was it. Tuffy had been hit by the gate, but he jumped clear. He was trained to run clear of the oncoming animals, but he wasn't going to let Bud get trampled. In all the commotion, the rest of the cattle come out of the shed, and I just, I couldn't see anything, but I could hear Tuffy barking, just barking and snapping and growling. I couldn't see, but I could hear the gate rattle, and I knew that Dad and Tuffy were under there. These were fat cattle that weighed 1,350 pounds, big, and they were running full steam when they went down there and went over that gate. He just, just rattled a bang. 
Tuffy had jumped in front of Bud and stood his ground, fighting off each of the dozens of cattle that charged at them. It kind of reminded me of a, of a train derailment. It was just an awful, awful noise. It seemed like at an eternity, I just, I just kind of froze, and I just absolutely figured that, that my dad was probably dead. Afraid of what he would find, Dwayne raced to his father. My leg! Oh, my leg! Ow. I thought they were going to trample me. <laughs> the first thing I seen was the gate down, Tuffy standing on top of the gate over dead. Miraculously, Bud was alive. The gate had crushed his leg and hip, but not one of the animals got past Tuffy to trample Bud. I'll get help. But Dwayne was worried his father might have internal injuries. He had to get to a phone immediately. But what about all the cattle still loose in the alleyway? Tuffy stayed right there beside Dad. He never moved. But I knew them cattle would not get near him because Tuffy stayed there with him. I did trust my dad's life with Tuffy. Grabbing the phone at the barn, Dwayne was so frightened that he could only remember one number. Oh, no. I, I couldn't think clear. Stay there. I had one thing on my mind, and that was my dad. So bless the good wife that I have. Don't move him. I remember my home phone number. And I'll call the ambulance. I knew that I needed to get out there ahead of the ambulance because I didn't want them roaring up that lane with sirens because those cattle would have been in the other state. We didn't want the cattle spooked any more than they already were. When I seen her come, it was a relief to me because uh, she's my better half. It's his leg. He looked good. He wasn't visibly shaken, it not really. Tuffy. The rest of us were. Bud required major surgery on his leg and hip. He would need an eight inch stainless steel rod inserted to fix it. But at the farm, the cattle still needed to be loaded. So Dwayne and Tuffy had to go right back to work. Dwayne later discovered something that made what Tuffy did even more amazing. Tuffy had a cracked pelvis and still jumped to the rescue. I feel as sure as I'm sitting here if it hadn't been for Tuffy, the family dog, that my father would not be alive today. Tuffy must have known the danger Bud was in, and in an instant put his own pain and safety aside to save Bud's life. He could have run just as hard as he could run the other direction, and he chose not to. He chose to stay there and protect, which he did. It's just a miracle. Well, if Tuffy hadn't been there, why, they'd have run right over top of me, that's for sure. Remarkably, both Tuffy and Bud have made a full recovery. Sure enough, Bud has gone right back to work, but at least his family knows he'll always have Tuffy by his side. Oh, I love that dog. That's the way I feel about my Tuffy. I absolutely love him. Well, Tuffy's special. About as special as you can get. We're always careful to treat our animal actors with care and respect. And if you know of anyone who's abusing an animal, please don't ignore it. Call your local shelter or humane society. You may save a life. That's our show for today. I'm Alan Thicke. This is Maggie. And we thank you for watching. Do you have an agent, Maggie? Because I see you in commercials, and I think you could be doing so much more. Career advice is important, and maybe a, a lawyer, even a manager, could help you with that. Personally, I could share some of my own vast experience.